A long time ago, I made a video about Ames, a discount retailer in the northeastern United States, which had a dramatic rise and a tumultuous fall, in part due to increased competition. One of those competitors being a company called Caldor, a beloved and well-respected chain also in the northeast. It had grown exponentially through the second half of the 20th century, all starting from a couple who wanted to build a retail chain known for quality. What's up guys, my name is Jake, and in this 77th episode of Abandoned, we're going to look at a regional chain started from humble beginnings and had grown to be the fourth largest retailer in America, just before it all came crashing down, leaving abandoned stores scattered across the retail landscape. This is Caldor. This episode of Abandoned is sponsored by NordVPN. Get an exclusive deal with a risk-free 30-day money-back guarantee by using my special link, nordvpn.com slash bright sun. It began with Carl and Dorothy Bennett, a recently married couple from New England. While they were shopping at a now-defunct discount brand in New York, they had an idea to start their very own company. In 1951, the couple pulled together $9,000 in savings to open a small store on the second floor of an old tire shop in Port Chester, New York. They created it under the name Caldor, a blending of their two first names, and opened the store with a new retail philosophy. Mr. Bennett in particular grew up as the son of a grocer, spending much of his childhood around consumer retail, so he was already pretty well acquainted with the industry. Carl and Dorothy set out to build a store with a concept that would essentially stock higher quality products than a typical discount store, but at the same time match their prices and provide excellent customers customer experiences while doing so. That concept was baked into their dream customer experience, where knowledgeable salespeople would be on hand along with other advantageous consumer practices like a generous return policy. Some of these concepts that made the customer feel special were already in place in other upscale establishments. However, Caldor was targeting the growing American middle class, particularly those who were seeking out deals for their everyday products. The store was filled with brand name hard goods from appliances to jewelry, and the store became known as the place to get everything the modern home may need. With these guiding principles in place, their first store became an instant hit, and the Bennetts quickly outgrew that first location, moving to an even larger space in 1953. With the introduction of more product categories, including apparel, the company expanded with another three locations and went public on the American Stock Exchange issuing over 120,000 shares at 5 cents a share. This dramatically boosted the retailer's liquidity, providing the company a path to expand and modernize, which in turn increased sales. By working out strategic deals with their vendors, Caldor was able to sell products at the lowest prices possible, which in turn boosted sales and fueled growth. Caldor was already very different from the existing discount stores that popped up post-war. By 1966, the company had nine stores across New York and Connecticut, and the brand had bolstered up their corporate leadership. Carl was acting CEO, while Dorothy was serving as the company's treasury secretary. By the 1970s, retail in America was in a massive shift. The population boom post-World War II had exponentially increased consumption, which in turn saw a new wave of big box retail dominate the market. Caldor was one of these new retailers, right alongside Kmart, Walmart, Bradley's, and Ames. However, this meant the new wave of discount retail would take away market share from others, and many companies would fold during this time, including the massive WT Grant chain, which would declare bankruptcy in 1976. Caldor would ultimately purchase a few of their defunct stores and make an easy and cheap entry into new markets. In fact, the 1970s as a whole proved to be a very successful decade for the company, expanding their retail presence with 63 stores by the dawn of the 80s. The chain had a strong presence in the Northeast United States and had been well loved by many shoppers in that region. So much so that the company was approaching $700 million in annual sales. That's around $2.8 billion today, just with 63 locations. But the conclusion of the 70s also meant an approaching recession, and with increased competition from other discount chains, the brand was open to new corporate partners. 
years. By 1981, Associated Dry Goods, a retail investment company whose portfolio already included upscale retail like Lord & Taylor, was actually interested in purchasing a controlling interest in Kaldor. The Bennetts had kept the brand in remarkably good financial condition, keeping the company's debt to absolute minimums. This attracted ADG, along with the possibility to expand the company even further, and they ultimately purchased the company for $313 million. The Bennetts were given a five-year-long contract to stay on as executive leadership, and under the financial backing of its corporate parent, Kaldor embarked on a sizable expansion campaign. Through the early to mid-1980s, the retailer opened more than 20 stores per year, rapidly expanding their presence and set up shop in new states like New Jersey and Massachusetts. Ultimately, the company would grow to over 100 stores by the mid-80s, with over $1.6 billion dollars in sales. That's doubling what they had seen less than a decade prior. But through all of this success, Carl Bennett had announced that he would retire in 1985, ending his 33-year-long leadership and finally leaving the company that he had started. Kaldor was now officially without the direction of the founding couple, and now solely in the hands of their new parents. ADG actually merged with another retail brand called the May Department Stores Company in 1986, which assumed all control over the subsidiaries that ADG owned, including Kaldor. The fact of the matter was, though, Kaldor was not all that profitable of a chain when they purchased it. Despite the immense success of the brand through the early 80s, much of it was attributed to the aggressive growth strategy, one that in turn built up a lot of debt. ADG didn't really have a clear strategy, and with a little knowledge of the discount goods segment, they let the company slip into becoming a popular brand, but one with a very messy balance sheet. Among many other issues, May department stores needed to fix the brand quickly. They brought in leadership from another discount subsidiary which they owned, called Venture, and they set up a plan to keep the company afloat. Almost immediately, their future expansion plans were put on hold, while existing stores were spruced up and excess inventory was sold off. A focus on apparel was put at the forefront, and advertising was scaled up. By 1988, only three new stores opened up, but May had brought the company off of life support. Kaldor generated a profit once again, and while it was only $50 million, it was seen as a positive sign for the future. But at the end of the day, Kaldor only accounted for a small fraction of May's overall income, and was a brand that they inherited from their acquisition of ADG. They didn't really want to put in the work to keep the brand alive, and by 1989, they sold Kaldor and all of its assets to a private investment firm called Odyssey Partners. They kept on current management, and continued on with a strategy of slow growth, focusing on key markets and modernizing operations for greater efficiency. By 1992, the company was showing really solid signs of growth, finally crossing the $2 billion mark and bringing the company back to the stock market, a way for Odyssey to pay off some of the debt they took out to buy Kaldor. With a bright outlook on the future of the brand, by 1995, Kaldor had 158 stores across the Northeast, with their stock at an all-time high of $32 a share. But despite all of this perceived success, everything was about to go catastrophically wrong. By September of the same year, 1995, Kaldor had filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. Despite the company being profitable the year prior, Kaldor found themselves in an apocalyptically bad situation. The string of events began with a declining year of sales, and a series of vendors suddenly deciding to renew their contracts with much higher payment terms. This sparked rumors of the company potentially being unable to make those payments, and opening the possibility of declaring bankruptcy, which of course worried investors, which sunk the stock price. The New York Times published a quote saying, The rumors that have been in the trade press over the last couple of months have led to a self-fulfilling prophecy. By the time of the bankruptcy, the stock had fallen to just $3.75. Their liquid cash was wiped out, and with a plummeting valuation, along with the enormous debt that was taken out to purchase the company in the first place, Kaldor was in hot water. But really, the big threat to the company was Walmart. While Kaldor was making $175 per square foot in sales at their stores, Walmart was making $275 per square foot. 
Walmart. They just couldn't compete with the mega retailer Walmart had become, and this put Caldor in a tough position with a little future promise. As the company reorganized and sought ways to exit their bankruptcy, the brand began closing underperforming stores in certain regions. By early 1998, the losses were mounting, and despite the company liquidating more and more locations, the hole they were in just seemed to get even deeper. The company was now delisted from the New York Stock Exchange, and really, there didn't seem to be much hope. Caldor was on life support, and after being in bankruptcy protection for nearly five years, and with mounting liabilities against the brand, creditors filed a motion in bankruptcy court to cut the losses and liquidate everything. Corporate leadership later agreed, and on January 22nd, 1999, Caldor announced it would convert into Chapter 7 and liquidate everything, thus shutting down all operations. The remaining 145 stores went into liquidation, and all 24,000 people who were employed by Caldor were laid off. Many of the stores were just purchased by other big retailers, and by summer of 1999, Caldor had officially closed down all retail operations, ending the nearly 50-year-old company. Despite most of the stores being bought up by other brands like Target, Walmart, and even Ames, there were a few remnants of Caldor spread around the retail landscape, sitting abandoned and appearing forgotten. Like this one in West Hartford, Connecticut, which closed as a Caldor and was subsequently purchased by Ames until they too closed. For years afterwards, the distinctive Caldor swept wing styling remained, but in typical American retail fashion, it was made into a more generic facade in 2000. Over in the densely packed Flushing's Queens, the massive facade with the oversized Caldor logo stood there abandoned for nearly a decade, but it too was completely reformatted in 2010, thus leaving behind no trace to its former big box retailer. In the end, Caldor was just out of time. Like Bradley's and Ames, who would fold shortly after, Caldor was a pioneer in discount retail for an era that didn't exist anymore. They trailblazed the upscale discount market segments in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, giving consumers a large big box space to shop for rock bottom prices, but also provide genuine service and quality goods. Caldor began from the dream of two people, and the many employees who worked there will tell you that the company culture was really something special, and it was in large part driven by the founding family. But the brand didn't stay that way forever, and while the Bennetts kept a healthy company alive and well, once the new owners came in, they wanted to maximize potential. The expansion campaign that they went on thereafter grew just about everything, from the brand recognition to the company's overall sales. But it also grew their debt load, and that would be something that would plague the company for the years that followed. Once the Bennetts left, many employees saw a shift overall, and from that point, it seemed like Haldor was always going to struggle. The crushing pressure from other competitors, along with bad timing, ultimately sealed the fate for the brand. And after two decades since the company went under, there really isn't much left. Basically, all of the abandoned stores from the early 2000s have either been renovated or redeveloped, and all that remains are maybe a few shopping carts or maybe a tractor trailer or two. But that's about it, and through my research, I don't think there's many stores left in existence. But if you do know of any abandoned stores, please let me know in the comments. What does remain, though, are the memories, both from the many shoppers who visited a Caldor store at the end of the 20th century, and the employees who largely remember Caldor fondly. There's also a great community of people who have archived media of the brand and the many stores that they left behind, primarily the Caldor Rainbow blog, which has an excellent archive. But perhaps the most impactful legacy of Caldor was the couple who built it. While Dorothy passed away in 2008, Carl Bennett had lived until he was 101 years old, when he ultimately passed too in 2021. Both of them were avid philanthropists, donating heavily to their local community with over $20 million in donations. I think in the end, Caldor was all about the Bennetts, and Carl had lived long enough to see the birth of his company as well as the death of it, along with many of their former competitors. While the brand and its many stores may no longer exist, the actions of the Bennetts and their legacy will always be remembered in the local communities that they helped, all stemming from the $9,000 they put up for their dream in the early 1950s.
So, as you may know, I like to travel, whether it's for filming videos or just for fun with Brights and Travels. NordVPN has always been an essential tool for me, either when I'm home or when I'm away traveling. They offer a suite of really helpful cybersecurity features which also protect your IP address from the watchful eyes of your internet service provider. But really, what I especially love using NordVPN for is getting around geographical content restrictions. That means if you're in the US or Canada and you want to watch something like The Office or Rick and Morty, which is only available on the UK Netflix, all you need to do is choose the UK, one of their 59 countries, connect to one of their 5400 servers, and just like that, you're watching something you couldn't have without being in that actual country. But why I think NordVPN is such a great sponsor for me specifically is because my very own movie, Closed for Storm, is not available for some people in other nations. So, if you want to watch my feature documentary on Amazon Prime Video, then simply connect to the US via NordVPN, and you're good to go. NordVPN just makes it so simple, and besides being an essential travel tool I take everywhere, it's a great and trusted VPN for your everyday use. So if you want to get an exclusive deal and help out my channel in the process, use my special link nordvpn.com slash brightsun. A link will always be in the description below, and it is risk-free since it comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. My name is Jake, and thank you very much for watching. South side of Chicago, 600 South State. There's a sign on a building that read Jesus saved. It's a mission for men who can't make it on their own. I'm homesick in Chicago.